Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome, CC, hello and welcome, one, two, three, four, five, six, she sells seashells by the seashore, she sells seashells by the seashore, there we go, rolling. There's a stable of filmmakers that you'll see again and again getting the grant from the funders who are philanthropists, and it can feel awful if you feel like you're on the outside of that, so... Don't be negative and defeatist. Build your own networks in your own regional place, wherever that may be. And also look for any kind of small family foundation that wants the cultural capital of a film. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 55, and it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Today is the first episode of 2018. It's also the first episode of our newer, our more streamlined format, which we talked about in our last episode. And not unlike most of our documentary projects, and really our lives for that matter, this is going to be a work in progress. So I should say in advance, thank you for your understanding, your patience, and your support you know, as we make our way through the early part of the new year. Today, we'll primarily be talking about the world of grant writing, which, of course, this is a world that, while critical to many of our doc lives, it's often a world that it, it seems to be a tricky, if not a pretty intimidating world to navigate. It's a subject that many of us know maybe a little, but not a lot about. And honestly, it's one of the topics that's often requested by you guys. So when we come back from a quick break, let's cast away any fear, any doubts, any hesitations about the subject of grant writing. And instead, let's just boldly go where more doc filmmakers than you may realize have successfully gone before. In December, I was finally able to connect with, with well-sought-after professional grant writer Joanna Raybigger. We'd been, we'd been trying to set up a conversation for recording since last summer, but, but conflicting schedules just hadn't really allowed for it to happen. Every few weeks, we, we'd touch base and, and see where one another was at, and, and then we'd you know, sort of make a vow to schedule something later on. But it, it kept getting pushed for, for one reason or another. And as I said, finally, shortly before Christmas, we were able to have our conversation for TDL. In fact, she'll be today's doc industry guest. That conversation, it was truly everything and more than I'd hoped for. Joanna will literally be speaking directly to the subject of grant writing and giving very actionable items that will help all of us not only become better writers of our grants, but also better storytellers and representatives of our films in general. Now, there isn't really all that much that I can share with you in regards to grant writing that Joanna can't share with you and most likely with far better detail and expertise. After all, she is a pro at this. This is what she does for a living, writes grants for documentary films. 
So what I will do before we get to that conversation is, is I'd like to share a little bit about my early experiences with grant writing, which, by the way, I'm a little embarrassed to admit it hasn't been where I'd hoped it would be by now. The truth is, over the past three years, this grant writing, it's weighed pretty heavily on both Steph's and my mind. Many, many occasions over the course of that time, we've we've sort of vowed to reestablish our commitment to writing grants for our film Elvis of Cambodia, our current project, which from, from any of the research and conversations with other filmmakers that we've had is most definitely a grant-worthy project. Steph's taken a, a grant writing course from a local university. We both have read numerous books. We've spoken with industry people, you name it. But the, the problem is for us is we simply haven't been able to find the proper time to commit to it. We've had two children in that time. We've both begun business ventures. We've relocated a few times. And carving out the proper headspace and time to truly write proper grant applications, well, it's just not happened. And the more time that goes by, the more we've become overwhelmed at the prospect of writing grants for Elvis, even though we know it is exactly what we need to be doing with the film right now. And I know I'm not alone here. I know it's probably an issue for many of you doc lifers. Recently, we've again been trying to re-summon our grant writing juju, if you will, for our film, and partly certainly inspired by my conversation with Joanna. I've remembered something that is helping ease the pain of the process of grant writing, and that's to start small, start more locally, specifically with, say, a local arts commission. It's where I had success with Journey to Kathmandu, applying for grants locally. Though I certainly applied for grants through through Sundance and, and, and NEH, and, and it should have been so painfully obvious to me that, that it was not the way to go for this type of film, especially coming from me, at the time a, a first-time doc filmmaker. So hopefully my story can inspire you a little bit by at least putting you at ease in the knowledge that there are funds and organizations out there for doc filmmakers who don't live in major cities like New York or London or Paris or, or L.A. There are, in fact, arts councils throughout the world, oftentimes in, in places like Ipswich, England or Rochester, New York or Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, who are looking to support their regional artists. In fact, it was something that Joanna said that reminded me of this, and, and it really rang true for me. And, and again, you'll hear that later on in that segment. Up until I started writing grant applications for my film Journey to Kathmandu, my only experience with grants was through proofreading a couple of other grants that, that friends had written and through creating a, a five-minute video for the film Bomb Hunters, the film that I was hired to work on in Cambodia, which introduced me to the world of, of documentary filmmaking. So I really had little idea of what I was doing when it came to grant writing for my Nepal doc. So as I mentioned earlier, I was kind of blindly starting to, to write applications for places like Sundance and NEH. And even though I, I realized how competitive these places probably were, I guess I was just kind of assuming that these were, you know, these are the places all doc filmmakers were applying for, for their grants. It'd be like thinking that the only festivals out there were Sundance, Cannes, and, and I don't know, Hot Docs. Like, like I said, I, totally naive to the whole thing, I was for sure. When I started hearing about a local arts commission that often gave grants out to artists in the Portland, Oregon area, I started to do some research and, and, and I came upon an organization called the Regional Arts and Culture Council. They were a quick 10-minute bus ride from me located in downtown Portland. And so I, I set forth to talk directly, hopefully, to someone uh, about exactly you know what they did. Again, kind of a naive move on my part. One should probably not show up unannounced you know, to an office building. But, but yeah, I, I, I guess I did anyway. And it did end up being one of the better decisions that I've made in my filmmaking career. When I got to their offices, I was quickly greeted by someone at the front desk, and she not surprisingly seemed, she seemed pretty miffed that I would show up without an appointment, but she kind of politely seated me and then, and then walked to another room. A few minutes later, one of the grant representatives who introduced herself as Helen, she took me back into this room of cubicles, and she sat me down, and, and she asked how she could help me. 
I, I told her I was wondering how I might get a grant for my film about goats being sacrificed in Nepal. Now, to her credit, this didn't seem to phase her at all. In fact, I think she kind of liked my polite audacity. Yes, I, I literally just came up with that now, polite audacity. I like that. And she, and she handed me some materials, and, and she explained that there was, there was actually a deadline coming up for submission in a few short weeks, and that if I, maybe if I had any questions, any further questions, I could, I could reach out directly to her via email or by an appointment. And she, she sort of smiled when she, when she mentioned the appointment bit. I thanked her, and I left with my materials. I went straight home, and, 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 and somehow inspired by my, well, my polite audacity and my, my lovely encounter with the good people over to Regional Arts and Culture Council, or RAC, as, as they're more commonly known in, in the Portland, Oregon area. Over the course of the next few weeks, I would email with Helen as well as an, another RAC representative, and, and I would always get a prompt email reply that would, it would either answer my, my, my question directly or, or, or it would direct me to an area where I could locate the, the proper information or the appropriate information. On the cutoff date for submissions, I arrived early, you know, passing my packet off to the front desk woman, and I asked if I could say a quick hello to, to Helen. And, and Helen came out again, and somehow she didn't seem surprised to see me. And she, she even sat down and went through my materials um, with me to make sure I'd done everything sort of to spec. It was, it was a great little exchange, and, and she said good luck. And then, well, then I waited for about three months to hear word from Rack. I did end up getting my first ever grant award from them for Journey to Kathmandu. I remember the day pretty well. I'd just gotten back from Thanksgiving on the East Coast where I was visiting family. I went to my mailbox and, and I saw that, that, that a letter had come from them. And I sort of said a silent namaste to Nepal and, and the goats there. And, and I opened the letter. And to my surprise, I'd, I'd received an early gift, uh, an early Christmas gift from, from the good people over to, to Rack. Now, I can't say that my introducing myself face to face over, um, you know, via email had any effect on me being awarded the grant. In fact, later I would find out how their grant select selection process worked. And I'm not sure knowing now what I know about that, that, that my early dialogue with Rack had any, any real effect on, on the final grant selections. But I will say this. The interactions that I had with them always seemed to make me feel good and confident about my project. It felt really satisfying to be sharing what I believed was a worthy project with a group of people who funded worthy projects and by nature were also excited and open to talking with people about their projects. That in itself was inspiring and like I said, quite satisfying. But now let's, let's think about this for a minute. I showed up unannounced. I was polite but passionate about my project, a project that was about the sacrifice of goats in Nepal, and I was emailing good follow-up questions afterwards. Isn't it human nature to remember that person? Wouldn't you want to help that person if in any way that you could? Now, again, I want to reiterate, I actually have zero knowledge of whether or not that helped my case later on, but I do kind of find it hard to believe that, that it wouldn't at least get my packet in front of someone who might maybe pay just a little bit more attention to my application. Like I said, I, I don't know, it's just a feeling, but we are humans, and that there's something important to remember in that. So I, I, I guess what I'm trying to impart here is, if anything at all, it's to look beyond the big obvious grant funding institutions. Leave them to the, you know, the throngs and thousands of people looking to get a piece of their pie. And instead, maybe suss out the more local arts commissions and get to know them. Have them get to know you and your project. Build a relationship with them. And then afterwards, regardless of results from your first grant applications, continue on with that relationship. I've invited Helen and, and Irene to fundraising parties and, and to premieres for my films. I, I, I email them over holidays. We ask about one another's families. Again, this kind of thing feels good, and I think it's helpful to our psyches as doc lifers. I really do. So yeah, reach out to your local arts organizations. Get to know them, and don't be shy about asking them questions about their grants. They like that. That's why they exist to support you guys, to support local artists.
I'd now like to introduce a newer segment to the show. It's called the Doc Lifer of the Week. It used to be called the Doc Lifer Community Question of the Week, and it was basically an, an emailed question or recommendation from a listener. But I've decided, for one, that's far too many words. And I've also decided that I want to make this a little bit more open-ended, you know, maybe include some social media posts from other Doc Lifers, introduce other Doc Lifers film projects, maybe highlight somebody's projects, that kind of thing. Um, for example, this week's Doc Lifer of the Week, it doesn't even come from one person. It comes from four countries. Yep. I've talked about how TDL is downloaded now in, in 128 countries around the world. How that we're clearly a globally connected community of doc filmmakers now. And the top five countries, in terms of download numbers, remains the same. The US, the UK, Canada, Japan, and Australia. But for my money, the Doc Lifers of the Week are from Spain, Portugal, Norway, and get this, Bosnia-Herzegovina. I mentioned doc filmmakers from these countries because we have seen significant increases in downloads in the past month emanating from these countries. In the past four weeks alone, Bosnia-Herzegovina has doubled the number of previous listeners. That's pretty cool, right? I mean, you guys know that I love this kind of thing. It always brings me back to a place of recognition that this documentary film passion that we have, this documentary life, it's something that people from all over the world, all walks of life, are participating in. Stories happen everywhere. And now, more than ever, people from those places are relating those stories to the rest of the world. And we're all better people for it. Now, next up, let us continue our exploration into the world of documentary grant writing when we sit down with professional documentary grant writer, Joanna Raybigger. I am Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is The Documentary Life. I'd like to give a special shout out and thank you to recording artist Delay, who has generously supplied tracks for this episode of The Documentary Life. For a list of those tracks, as well as a link to Delay's work, please visit the show notes for this episode. There are plenty of places online to learn how to do things like split the audio signals coming into your camera, or how to animate some of your still photos, or get some great tips on lighting your interview, many blogs, YouTube videos, and of course podcasts where you can quickly grab an answer to a tech-related question. But what if there was one place where you could learn from beginning to end how to make a documentary film and how to become a doc filmmaker, how to raise money and build an audience for your doc, how to form strategic partnerships and launch your doc out into the world, and perhaps even, if you can imagine, make some money from it? Well, there is such a place, and it's called the Documentary Academy. Steph and I took two years to build out this comprehensive resource that takes you step-by-step step from story creation and pre-production all the way to post-production, launch, and distribution. The Academy takes you through your doc filmmaking journey as your most confident, active, strategic, creative, focused, and articulate self. It is a step-by-step -step guide to empowerment in the documentary filmmaking world. We know what we have in the Documentary Academy. Now it's up to you to discover what you have as a doc filmmaker. Do that today by heading over to thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Joanna Raybigger is a fundraiser and professional writer for documentary films, which includes, of course, proposals as well as crowdsourcing. She is a leading specialist in writing funding proposals for documentary films, including story development and treatments. Her background is in book editing as well as film editing. She has worked closely with films like Rich Hill, Girl Model, The Guardians, and Justin Shine's Left on Purpose. And I mentioned Justin's film because, of course, we had Justin on the program uh, about a year ago uh, on the show. Uh, Joanna, welcome to the welcome to the show. I know we've been trying to get you on here for a little while, so um, this seems like a great time to do that. Thank you so much for joining us today on The Documentary Life. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. 
Absolutely. I think a great way to start this, Joanna, would be to um, get right into some sort of sort of some of your background. I'm assuming you must have an interest in documentary film initially. Um, when was that, and, and what did that look like? Well, I was actually in a documentary film. Um, my dad uh, made documentaries for the BBC, um, and uh, you know there are many, many ironies to the story. But he actually put us in a documentary, uh, me and my siblings. Uh, so I remember the crew being there. Really? And that was a very, very long time ago. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess he, he had to make them under pressure, you know, so he it, it's always difficult to sort of cast things. So yeah, I mean, he right, had to make right. a very, very quick turnaround. So as I grew up, uh, uh, I grew up in England and he, and he was in America. My parents divorced him. Uh, and I didn't see very much of him, but I would always hear about, you know, documentary film. And then I actually ended up going to his school, um, Columbia College, where he had carved out uh, a sort of new American career teaching. Mm. And I just got really hooked. And then I um, I ended up going into publishing in England right. because it sort of seemed like the, the thing that I should be doing because I was, you know, <laughs> very kind of analytical and but I always in the back of my mind I always kept thinking you know what dad does and what all his students do it just seems so amazing um and as soon as I heard that video um editing I was always very interested in editing and I'd yeah. edited film as soon as I heard it had gone digital I sort of called my dad up and I said you know I'm just really itching to do to be back in film oh and wow interesting that's how I ended up coming to the States. Uh, he helped me. And yeah, oh. so I ended up cutting MSA thesis films uh, at Columbia College and, um, you know, just really got into it through editing, which I still love. Uh, yes. I mean, I don't do it, but I just have the most enormous respect for editors. Uh, I mean, you're preaching to the choir here on the program. We have a <laughs> lot of doc filmmakers that editing is... is um, is it's a big topic we've uh we recently yeah. had um a, a, a gentleman from the uk by the name of patty bird who has spent years uh -huh. and years uh doing documentary and reality tv editing and he has this fantastic uh program called inside the edit um an online Ooh. courses and uh it's it's an Ooh. entirely different immersive approach that i have yet to have, mm -hmm. have seen done with editing and i'm an editing geek myself having been brought up in the editing yeah. world that's where i initially carved out mm -hmm. my um, my work in the industry was an was as an editor and so wonderful um, yeah we we're we're big fans of post-production editing here on the program so mm -hmm. i love to hear that i uh wow joan i have to ask is, is your father michael raybigger he is. And so, you know, I'm, it, you, I hope there's not too many Freudians out there because you're all going to diagnose me as some kind of yeah. Oedipal, <laughs> a lost child of Michael Rabiger. But yeah. uh, yes, and so, you know, he, because I grew up in England yeah. and he was in America, I didn't really, you know, so I guess in some, you know, if you're going to psychologize it, I did end up, you know, I, I didn't really read his books, but, mm. you know, all my friends, whenever my friends got into film yeah. they would always say oh my god i'm using your dad's book of course it's... directing the and documentary so always... i mean that thing was instrumental yeah. i literally lugged this book around with me on my first doc in nepal in the middle of the himalayas in the middle of the mountains oh. and you can imagine like this well, book that's... was bigger than anything except my camera equipment yeah. <laughs> and that's what dad intended because he really is a very very sweet person and he's a real he really wanted to empower you know, all kinds of people, anybody yeah, yeah. to to make documentaries. And he had worked in the BBC and he didn't have a degree. He'd come up through um, the studio system, just starting out as a tea boy and then, you know, on the cutting room floor. And yeah. he had really worked. And so he, I think I really do share with him that feeling that, you know, anybody can make a film. And I think that's why he, he kept waking up in the middle of the night and thinking, I need to <laughs> write down what I'm teaching. And that's, that was a sort of humble beginnings of that book. And I think I'm in it in the same way that mm. I just, you know, I just remember seeing student work and just thinking, 
how wonderful it was. Yeah. And it's just been fantastic to see this explosion of documentary over the last, you know, decade since I've been in the States. Well, I, I will say I, 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 I'm, it's great to hear that, uh, that, that, uh, that I have a connection maybe perhaps with Michael Rabiger now, because we would love to have him obviously on the program at some point. Um, uh, yeah, he, in I'm fact, sure I think there's a, a newer that. edition yeah. of the book. So, However, Absolutely. this is your show today, Joanna. So. <laughs> <laughs> your dad's going to have to wait. <laughs> you you mentioned yeah, something he, about, you know, you said anybody can make a doc film. And and yeah. and it's true in many ways this day and age, yeah. right? With with the yeah. the where technology is and the the affordability of technology. Um mm-hmm. I would agree with that. But where I but where I I, I pause with that whole idea mm-hmm. of anybody can make a film is, well, not anybody can make a film that has fundraising behind it, or I should say mm-hmm. has funds mm-hmm. behind it, and mm-hmm. and a big part of documentary filmmaking is of course raising one's funds, and a big part of raising mm-hmm. one's funds is 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 that 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 mythical grant writing with a capital G mm-hmm. and 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 that's mm-hmm. where you come in Joanna that's that's your specialty now that's what you've made a career mm-hmm. out of doing now for years how did how did mm-hmm. grant writing happen for you and and why the interest in such a way that it moved you in a direction of mm-hmm. hey you know what i i can do this and i can do it well i'm going to help other mm-hmm. people do it how how did that whole thing happen well i you know, was living in Austin, and um, there are, are a number of filmmakers here in Austin. There were more, and many of them have moved away. A couple of them teach at Northwestern now. Mm-hmm. One was, you know, Heather Courtney, who is just, you know, one of our major, major right. doc filmmakers right. now. Um, and uh, uh, she and uh, others asked me, you know, to help them. And I guess I was doing a photo producing and editing, but I just had a baby. Um, and it just seemed something sort of manageable. And I think I did it quite badly to begin with. Uh, <laughs> it took a long time to learn. So I think that, you know, when you ask me to help on a film, just mm. bear in mind, I have been doing it for a long time. And I think I made lots and lots of mistakes. And finally sort of figured out uh you know you have to show the story arcs you have to be very very boiled down you have to have an elevator pitch but i think it took quite a long time and luckily i didn't charge very much in the beginning (laughs) um but i think i learned through feedback um especially from itvs because they would you know give feedback but the first successful project was um that got funding from pretty much everybody and that was you know, largely down to the filmmakers networking, mm. which I'll, you know, talk about that later. Um, but it's called Give Up Tomorrow, and it's about a miscarriage of justice in the in the Philippines. And it really was an amazing model of a film because it, it was very outreach first. It was yeah. all about, uh, very much like Southwest of Salem is another outreach first film that actually right. changed, um, you know, things for the subjects in, in the film. And I think that was, all part of that, you know, outreach-driven filmmaking. Um, but that was Marty Sayuko and Michael Collins. Michael who, Collins, right? Yes, who recently had uh, Almost Sunrise um, yes. on POV, which is another very outreach-driven film. And I'm a huge admirer of their work, and I I always have loved working with them. And and I, you know, I have worked with them over the years. Um, so that was. It was that uh, uh, Give Up Tomorrow yeah. project, which took, I, I will, if for your audience, I'll just tell you that, mm. um, you know, we kind of developed the story through the grant writing. Uh, yeah, because we kept that's having the right treatments. Mm. Yeah. And every time we got a treatment, we had a little bit more story to update because they'd just done more shooting. Right. But we also, as we were writing the treatments, we were thinking, you know, we we just need to, we really decided what the premise was and we really moved it away from the drier end of things to the more emotional beats of the story. Right. And I think that's where I really learned, you know what, it's, 
it's not about the issue, it's about the characters and the story, and you've got to get that across. Um, but of course, it is, it is a film that uh, helped spark um, an innocence project for the first time in the Philippines. In the Philippines, right. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a story-driven film, but it's, um, you know, it's had real impact. You mentioned something there that that uh, I had been I, I can't remember if I read this in an article and in an interview with you or perhaps uh, p- perhaps it was a couple of years ago. I think you were on um, blog talk. I think you were on a podcast with why am I forgetting her name um, from the Heart Productions, Lady Carol Carol mm-hmm. Lee Dean, and yeah, the, and and a big part of what you were discussing was it's easy for doc filmmakers to forget, you know, you know, it's easy to get bogged down in, in some of these grant writing or these grant applications mm-hmm. because you think it needs to be, you can get bogged down sort of in the technical aspects and you mm-hmm. think you should be using technical languaging when, in mm-hmm. when, when the irony is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here is actually it's mm-hmm. really about getting the people that are, that are looking through these applications moving them in an emotional way, not unlike what you do with your film. And so you don't have Mm -hmm. to necessarily, would you say you don't, it's more Mm -hmm. important to be emotive with your languaging Mm -hmm. and creating a story in your application than it is the actual technical, like, like you're writing a technical manual. Absolutely. Um, You know, I was lucky enough to sit in, uh, I was at Camden International Film Festival and I sat in on one of those sort of ITVS, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the guy. He mm. he was an ITVS guy. May not be there anymore. I can't remember. He used um, a wonderful film as an example and talked us through. You know, uh, the film had a, a, a lot more visual subtext and beat. Uh-huh. And you know, it was one of those moments when I realised. Um, you know, yes, you're very clever and <laughs> you understand all the issues and everything, but how do, much do you actually understand about story and screenwriting? And ah. I really, really started to focus on screenwriting. And so what, what you're saying is so right, that the funders are, uh, they see a million and one issues, they see a million and one proposals, okay. and they want to see something cinematic on the page. So yes, to, in answer to your question, absolutely. You, you And you move them... They are, you know, many of these funders are filmmakers. So you move them by showing them your craft Mm. on the page, Mm. Mm. showing them the the kind of visual economy, you know, um, and showing them something that is very cinematic, but you're using the medium of of language to do that. Mm. Um, I'll give you an example, which is a a film called My Country No More. Um, Yes by Jeremiah Hamling and Rita Baghdadi, who are just wonderful filmmakers. And so they had um, lots of, you know, they had a rough cut and everything uh, of this film, which is sort of about the impact of fracking on a small town in um, uh, ne- Nebraska. Oh, right, no, right. Sorry, North Dakota. In North Dakota, sorry, that's North right, Dakota. Nodak, yeah, yep. Sorry. Um, and uh, they... They hired me to kind of, re- they were sort of not getting anywhere with it. Hmm. And they hired me to kind of figure it out. And what I ended up saying was, you know, you have a much more emotional story here. And that's what we need to do. And they did a lot of, I did the rewriting and they did a lot of rewriting and recutting. And it just turned the film around. Um, it sounds deceptively simple, but it was that. Again, that kind of recognition that, you know, you have a story about a community. It's much more like a narrative film than you probably even realize. Mm. Um, So that's what we did with that one. And it's been really successful. They got Parry Lorenz funding and they got ITVS. And, you know, I think it's going to be absolutely beautiful. I love I love where this conversation's going, Joanna. You're helping us demystify this process that, that oftentimes it seems like it seems like this impossible mission for us doc filmmakers. Um, mm-hmm. Should these be shorter sentences? Should these not be long and lengthy? And, mm-hmm. and, 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 and does that help us then become more cinematic in the way we're constructing these shorter sentences? Yes, short, you know, short, active sentences, visual 
descriptions of scenes, um, uh, you know, pinpointing turning points clearly. Um, and even with the most seemingly issue driven film, um, and she, uh, you know, I'll get to other things that she gave us feedback on because it was such a, an amazingly useful call. Yeah. But in terms of the writing style, yes, that visual style, you know, a really good exercise, um, is to actually describe your rough cut in visual uh, terms, almost like a, a visual transcription, mm -hmm. um, almost as though you're writing for the blind, you know, um, somebody who couldn't see the film, maybe could hear it, but yeah. you, you know, uh, so I think that's when you start to get into a more dramatic style of writing uh, so that you're actually, the film should feel like it's unfolding uh, you know, the treatment that the funders all break the proposal up very sensibly mm. into, you know, they, they separate out the, the topic, the, the topic summary from the story okay, for a right. good reason. Yeah. So I think it's a great discipline just to separate the two out. You know why you're making the film mm. and what it's going to do. And you write about that in your outreach section. But when it comes to the story part, just stick to what do you see? You know, what do you see first, next, you know, bit by bit. And then I think if you have a sort of paragraph per act or, you know, maybe a longer treatment, um, you know, you're doing a a paragraph per scene kind of thing. Right. Uh, it's, it's rare to actually have to do that much detail. It's probably only NEH that requires yeah. that, you know, complete a script. So and, that's what it's about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's interesting. I re, it, it reminds me of when Steph and I were first doing a a we were doing our Kickstarter campaign for our current doc mm -hmm. project, Elvis of Cambodia, and uh -huh. doing that, running that campaign is really a a massive part. And and we hadn't even gotten to Cambodia to do our 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 filming yet. But doing that Kickstarter campaign really helped. Um, it helped start putting on paper what our story, mm -hmm. or at least what we anticipated mm -hmm. our story would, would, like you said, look like perhaps visually. And mm -hmm. we did so much writing during that time, whether it was for, you know, social media bursts, whether it was for the mm -hmm. writing the Kickstarter page, whether it was the emailers that we, that we were sending out. So much mm -hmm. of that writing is happening on a constant basis that you're, and the website as well, that, that you're, you mm -hmm. have to be you're refining what the story is and who the characters are mm -hmm. all of the time. And of course that changes once exactly. you start filming and, and, and doing that actually. And, and you start putting mm -hmm. together a rough cut, but, but what you say really rings true to me because it's through the act. It's like you're practicing writing what, um, what mm -hmm. your film is about constantly and you're mm -hmm. refining it and making it more powerful and more emotive constantly. That's right, and I think that's why it's a very useful exercise to get to do, regardless of whether or not you get the funds, because right. um, because you are you know very conscious when you're filming the next uh, sequence, you're conscious, you know, oh, we don't really have this. It's like doing a paper edit. Mm, that's sense. right. Um, so it's very very useful just for developing the film, regardless of whether you get the money or not. Um, and then I will say. Uh, that if you keep applying to ITBS, you know, they have a very limited amount of funding and a very small pool, um, but they have an absolutely transparent, you know, process. meritocratic process. And so you can apply twice a year for oh. <laughs> a few years and you get feedback. And, you know, having whittled away at that um, on several different projects, it's astonishing if you actually listen to their feedback mm. and address it, um, you do end up getting a contract with them. Um, you know, that has happened. That has happened with several films I've worked on. Yeah. And it's very humbling because, you know, they see so many and they, they have an in-house person, two in-house people, and then they have, you know, the, the um, outside advisors who they change that panel. But as many of your listeners will know, um, you know, people complain about the ITVS system and, and are sort of hurt 
every time that they're rejected. <laughs> um, but it just makes you so much tougher if you keep listening to what they're saying and incorporating it. And right. uh, eventually you, you end up with a better project, I, I think. How can we build a country without identity, without memory, without a strong culture? Joanna, what part does the teaser or, or so, you know, with some of these more like post-production mm-hmm. funds, you know, they want at least a 10 or a 20 minute segment. What part does mm-hmm. that video play in the process? Um, and what mm-hmm. can you tell us about what should we, what, what 10 minute segment should we be sending them? Such a good question. I mean, ITBS are very clear that, you know, the, the sample that you submit should really pair with the um, with the written proposal. And I'm pretty sure folk films say that, have said the same thing. Not everybody says it explicitly, but mm. um, the, the, you need to read the proposal and then feel that the the trailer is um, really matching it. Mm. Um, and that you, you know, the funders need to know that you're really delivering what you promised. Um, and I think that, it can be a mistake to try and cut a trailer. I think all of us who've been through yeah. the trailer cutting process understand that it's tra- cutting trailers is an art. Yes, it is. And it's <laughs> something you sort of do at the end of the film when you're marketing it. And, um, you know, I think that just having a, a nice, humble kind of slice of your film that shows some okay. arcs, sometimes you can't do that if you're just in the beginning stages. Right. Um, you have to sort of, uh, map out what the issue is. I think Fernanda Rossi's book, uh, Trailer Mechanics, is brilliant. Um, she's obviously, you know, one of the best uh, sort of consultants on story. Um, yeah. And, uh, but I, I think that overall, you know, don't try and polish a trailer. It's better to take something that's very theme based in your film. Um, And there are red flags that, you know, just just be clear, have clear signposting. You can't tell the whole story, but if you can just show some of the texture and atmosphere uh, and try and find a sort of dramatic axis. How polished does that that section, that slice, how polished does it need to be? Well, I think it can be work in progress, uh, you know, as long as it's audible and it's not too muddy and dark and... Um, you know, I, do, I think over polishing is probably more of a problem than um, just choosing the right point in the film. Just be emotionally intelligent about it. Yeah. You know, um, what does somebody need to to see? The problem, just to back off a little bit, uh, the problem with most documentary films is that the filmmakers are so close to their subjects; they're in love with the <laughs> right, subject, yeah. and they forget that not everybody cares or feels it uh and that's the problem just in general if your film is not going anywhere you're in love with your subject you know maybe maybe the casting isn't that great but maybe people don't share your fit mm. your enthusiasm mm. for the central subject and just be careful about having them you know talk too much like leave silences leave space ah, for the interesting. audience the funder to draw their own conclusions right you know right that kind of thing yeah Let's talk about mis- sort of common mistakes that doc filmmakers make when mm-hmm. they're putting together, when they're doing their grant writing. Give us three common mistakes that you see doc filmmakers making when they're doing their grant proposals. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think the number one mistake is to put the issue first before the story. And um, that's a mistake um, hmm. that people make where they they feel they have a very important issue um, and uh, you know, you're not really seeing much of a story where is the film going um, so that that's the most common mistake that I see yeah. uh, is, you know, very very formal language is probably the second mistake uh, that's, kind of, uh, that's what I was getting to earlier but yeah. I, I wasn't I wasn't yeah. really saying it very well no, I, 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 it, it occurred to me as you were talking that, that people, I, I want to sort of say, you know, everybody needs to relax when they're writing a proposal. This is not for graduate school. You know, this is, 
this is an emotive art form. Um, so, uh, you know, use, um, use emotive language. I mean, use language sparingly, but, yeah. um, don't be too dry. Don't be too formal. Recognize also that there's probably about 10 other films that are in front of the funder that are on the same topic. Wow. Um, or around the same topic. Yeah. Um, so that's why story and how the issue was revealed is so important. The funders are looking for um, the kind of story that, that builds empathy and reveals, but not in a kind of didactic way. You know, it is an art form. Uh, I'm trying to think of a third mistake. Yeah, long sentences can be a real problem. Hmm. Uh, informal language can also be a problem. Um, uh I'd say the main problem is the lack of a story. You know, that's why it's so imperative to separate out story and topic. Okay. Yeah, and I think one thing that I'm possibly not paying enough attention to is, you know, if you're asking for money, hmm. uh, do spell out how you're going to use it. And it's something that the Fork Films uh, funder was, you know, very, very nicely um explaining that she's a filmmaker that all these funders are filmmakers pretty much and they understand the process so if you're asking for 25k you know explain why how is that money being used why do you need that 25k exactly exactly? yeah and really budget it out you know show them what you're going to do with it because i think there is a real problem with um accountability uh you know and and filmmakers run the gamut some are very very smart entrepreneurial you know tightly budgeted you know people like you who are working in the business and then there's another end of the spectrum where people you know people can overspend and you know and i don't think any funder wants to they they want to know what their money is going to be spent on and what how it's going to move the, the project forward now and that and and it's completely 100 percent makes sense and i and i i can see why that uh, that has to be done but i think what's surprising to me joanna is to hear that um that it even needs to be mentioned to begin with and i say that because any sort of proposal that that we have written and any sort of any grant proposal that we've been involved in Mm -hmm, a budget mm -hmm. is always a critical part of that package and so you have to be budgeting and everything out Mm -hmm. anyhow so what is it Mm -hmm. that you're seeing that some filmmakers aren't doing i I mean don't they have to put in a budget in their proposals they do but i think there's usually a space in in the core documentary proposal which is now you know the sort of central Hmm. document that most funders are accepting um you know you can find it online the core documentary proposal is is the template that uh, you know everybody's trying to use this because um it really helps filmmakers to simplify their process yeah um and there is a space in that um you know asking the filmmaker to explain how they're going to use the funding so i think it's you know yes you can have the excel budget um and do you know robert i don't know how to say his last name bahar um b-a-h-a-r right robert bahar has a wonderful sample out there that i think some of the funders are asking um you know filmmakers to use so i think um using a very kind of standardized budget and really making sure if they ask for a comprehensive budget Hmm. and not a summary posture make sure you you know supply that uh, show all the detail. Um, I, I just wanted to back up for a second um, for clarification for 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 my listeners. Yeah. The documentary core application project that you're referring to was a document that was released by IDA, correct? Yes, I believe it was IDA uh, that initiated it. I think there was a discussion amongst funders. Um, it, you know, they have the language on their web website. Mm. Uh, they recognize that filmmakers were being driven nuts by all the different lengths of verbiage, you know, 300 characters here and, (laughs) you know, 3,000 characters here and, you know, six pages here. I mean, it just was all over the shop. So now we have this simplified um, process, which is possible to use. It's very, very helpful. Uh, It's exhausting to have to write about the film, the same film in multiple different lengths of verbiage. Right. so that's a large reason why people hire a 
the grant writers because they just get so exhausted by having to say the same thing over and again slightly differently. Um, so this has really helped. Um, and once you have your core mm. documentary proposal, you only really have to update it here and there. Um, so it's a great thing to really invest time in in doing. Absolutely. And and and, and for my listeners, what I will go ahead and put a link up to the documentary core application project within the show notes mm-hmm. of this program because I think it's a mm-hmm. obviously a um, at this point. It is a. It's kind of an essential thing that we need to do as as we put together our grant applications. Should we be in contact, and if so, how regularly with these grant making institutions beforehand mm-hmm. and throughout the process? Should we be asking questions? Should we di- be dialoguing mm-hmm. openly with them about our projects? Does that help in any way, or does it hinder in any way? Well, um, you know, such a great question. Um, I think the projects that has got funding is has very little to do with me and so much more to do with the efforts of the filmmakers to network. Mm. Um, now I live in the middle of the country in Austin and um, I'm well aware that of the frustrations um, that, you know, we have in the middle of America, we can't network with the funders tend to be on the coast. So, uh, you know, we, at the Austin film society has a travel grant now that gets, our filmmakers out to the coast oh, wow. to mingle and network. Mm. Um, I think everybody has different networks, um, you know, different local funders. Use your local uh, film society to network. If Sundance is coming to town to do a creative, you know, workshop, go and, and introduce yourself. And, um, you know, I think that most funders, are really, really busy. Uh, I think ITVS has a very um, uh, a very kind of transparent progress. They look at everything. I'm sure all funders look at everything, but I think that, uh, you know, in the case of Sundance, for example, it, it's global. Anybody from the world can apply. Right. So, you know, and they don't have that big a staff. So it, it just <laughs> makes sense that it's difficult for, you know, of all funders, I'd say that's probably one of the most challenging ones because, you know, can you even guarantee that anybody's really paid attention to your project wow. um, if you're completely not, you know, on the outside? And so I think the way that it tends to work is that the pitching forums are more important than people probably realize. Um, well, I'm sure your listeners do realize how important they are. So it's really, you know, raising the profile of your, your film yes. and um, trying to shop it around in person Um you know, Kickstarters can really help raise the profile. Um, social media really helps. Um, teasers, all that kind of thing to get it on people's radar. Yeah. And of course, you know, recognize that there are sort of trends in funding. Mm. Um, there are topics that, you know, because of the cultural landscape, suddenly start to seem more important. Um, so, uh, you know, but then again, if you have a real... Uh, kind of, you know, a very sort of idiosyncratic film, don't despair either. If the craft is good enough and you show that, um, it should get somewhere um, if it's story-driven enough. I think you can't can't rely too heavily on fundraising in any case. It's only really a, you know, a tiny percentage of your overall plan. I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, that is a great point, Joanna. Uh, something you mentioned, and you use Sundance as an example of of just mm-hmm. how inundated they certainly are with these grant applications, and mm-hmm. how you know you may even as a filmmaker worry, wow, how do I even know if this is actually really taken in by mm-hmm. someone? What are the things that we doc filmmakers can do to avoid that sort of a situation? Like there must be some mm-hmm. things that you know, like a Sundance or another grant mm-hmm. uh, grant making institution, there must be certain sort of red flags that they pull immediately if we haven't included mm-hmm. something or we've we've written right. something in the wrong way. What are those things we shouldn't be doing that don't automatically disqualify us is I guess what I'm asking. Check your eligibility mm. carefully. That's rather obvious, but um, I think it's very, very difficult for first-time filmmakers. Um, you know, if you... If you look at the ITVS website, I think they do have some kind of language that sort of dissuades a first-time filmmaker. You know, they're using yeah. government money yeah. 
why on earth would they <laughs> have any faith in somebody who's never made a film before, knowing how difficult it is? That's right, and we film. certainly shouldn't um, take that personally. That's a great, realistic point. Yeah, so, you know, maybe don't apply for ITVS if you're a first-time filmmaker. Yeah. Uh, look for the smaller local funders, you know, your local film society, your local humanities council, uh, any kind of foundation that's related to your issue. Um, so the red flag, I think, is, you know, often I think films just don't get noticed at all because they're just not, there's no buzz about them. There's nobody's really mm. heard of the filmmaker. Um, there's no sort of track record. Um, you know, it's not, it's not a fair world. Uh, and right. there are definitely networks. And so, you know, one thing I do with, with some of my clients is we just look at LinkedIn and we look to see who we know in common. Oh, wow. And, you know, it's not a sort of nepotistic thing. It's mm. just that, you know, there are certain, you know, passionately engaged, uh, people who, uh, you know, certain funders are trying to advance, uh, you know, uh, some kind of progressive movement somewhere in their work, and right. they're using film to do it. And so look for those connections and look for friendships, because if somebody's, you know, got a trusting friendship and they can put in a good word for you yeah, then yeah. with somebody related to a funder, it helps. That's right. That's um, right. So let, let's move forward here towards them. Um, uh, as we're getting closer to wrapping up here, Joanna, what I would like to understand now, and this is, we've heard a bit of, you know, we've heard a bit about uh, some great suggestions and recommendations when putting together mm-hmm. our grant, our grant applications. Mm-hmm. My question now, Joanna, is why should someone hire you to do what you do? What is it that you bring to the table um, that separates Mm -hmm. somebody else's film from the pack or their grant application from the pack? Well, I, I've been doing this for a long time. And so I'm very specialized. Um, I feel that I can really be honest with filmmakers and really ask them for the awesome questions that uh, are going to help them get into a more critical mode around their own project without deflating them. I love filmmakers. I love artists. I champion uh, filmmakers. And I recognize from my own experience of filmmaking or, you know, any kind of artistic pursuit, how vulnerable one feels and how uh, exhausting the whole process is. So I feel like I'm doing a mixture of buoying up (laughs) filmmakers, but not flattering them and saying, well, what is your story about? Well, why is it important? You know? And so, we're writing a selling pitch, mm. but we're doing it in a very authentic way. Um, we're just really trying to strengthen what the project's uh, you know, strong points are. The reason to hire me is because I've been doing it for so long and I've worked on films. Yeah. I lot think a lot of grant writers have done stuff for non-profits or whatever, and they might be interested in film, but they haven't actually worked on film. Completely. So I think that that's where I sort of stand out because I'm – understanding of what the filmmaker is going going through and i also understand the process so i know that if you're you know just starting production it's different to being in a rough cut stage and i'll be very honest about a rough cut and say you know there's a lot more work you know for the finishing fund we're going to need to get a really good editor Mm, on mm, mm. uh, a name editor and explain what we'd use 25k on to make this film good um Mm. i think i'm also good at writing the outreach parts of things because I do really like outreach and I've worked in kind of outreachy um, positions. So I think I understand the outreach. I I understand how to articulate a film's potential impact. Joanna, you Um, are obviously in great demand for what you do. So how do you... How do you choose your projects? And and part of that, I'll say, is, is how does someone approach you with their project? Well, I think it's hard for people because they you know everybody's using their own money um so that's right. why i work on so many different projects because i don't think anybody has a very big budget mm. and people are using me here and there um as they try and kind of inch along um so <laughs> i you know i try to you know not overtax i mean do too much for filmmakers and just sort of empower them at the right point mm. So you can reach me through my website has um, 
a contact form um, and you can reach me through that and you know it's a d- discussion to see what you need at any given time right um, but I'm used to working on films for uh, small amounts of time intermittently coming in and out you hmm. know as deadlines approach hmm. uh, I would say that the big sort of heavy lifting is writing that core documentary proposal yeah um, so it's great if you actually have a crack at it yourself yes um, because you'll save a lot of money on my rates are pretty affordable yeah. um, but at the same time you don't want to be inventing the story with me Mm-mm. you know a right. I'm not uh, I'm not a screenwriter and B but it's going to take hours and hours of my time so yeah. I would say come to me when you are you know when you're sort of at a kind of crossroads with your film you've got so far but maybe you need to re-spin things or tighten something up or you know work more on story or something like that so joanna Um, if i were to approach you with a project right and i have i have my project i've done i've been in post on it for a little while i have a documentary mm -hmm. core application i've done that whole process and Mm -hmm. i present that to you and i ask you Mm -hmm. to help me out at that point um, and if you are going, and if you were to, to agree to do that, what are your rates like? How, how how does that work? Yeah, my rate's very simple. It's sixty dollars an hour, which you know I always joke is about what it costs to get a plumber in. <laughs> that seems incredibly, incredibly yeah. reasonable. Well, I'm not an expert on anything. You mm. know, uh, I'm really just somebody who can help. Uh, and if and it's down to the filmmaker to decide is it helpful or or not. And So I try and keep it reasonable because, you know, I'm not a great big consultant like Philander Rossi or somebody like that. Mm. I don't go to, I mean, I'm in Austin most of the time at my desk, but I do see a lot of projects and that gives me a good overview. Yeah. Um, And I can write, you know, that's what it sort of comes down to. I'm sure there's lots of people out there. I think producers are often brilliant writers and really can present their films very, very well. But they're often very, very busy. So I get a lot of producers coming to me just needing help because they're busy producing. You know, they just need somebody to get it and write it. And, you know, I think if you need just a read, a feedback on something, I can be very honest and say, well, punch this up and make more of this. Joanna, as as we wrap up here, is there anything that you can think of that jumps out that me, that maybe we've missed in the conversation that would be important to to my audience, which would, a lot of my audience are are in fact first and second time documentary filmmakers? Yeah, I would say that you know the biggest mistake you could make is to just hire a grant writer and just passively hit the deadlines with ah. you know a proposal, and um, it can't do any harm. Um, but you're going to need to do more than that. And that means networking and getting out and about. Be active with your local film community. Film is a gregarious social, you know, it's a world of discussions and arguments and debates and trends. And so don't be a hermit. Go and, you know, flock with other filmmakers. And also, you know, be... uh, participatory in the sense that you might help somebody else with their rough cut um you know and and really just treat it as a a big community thing um in i think another thing just to wrap up very quickly do not rely on grants Hmm. Uh, the chances of you getting a grant are so slim and there are (laughs) filmmakers who get multiple grants because they are in a kind of thick you know, area where they count, they they are representative of a you know marginalized group, or they are somebody who is um, has a really really unique perspective, right. or they've you know really really craft they're really great verite filmmakers. There's a stable of filmmakers that you'll see again and again getting the grant mm, from mm. the funders. Who yeah, are absolutely, you do. Yep. And it can feel awful if you <laughs> yeah. feel like you're on the outside of that. So. Be, don't be negative and defeatist. Build your own networks in your own regional place, uh, wherever that may be. And also look for any kind of small family foundation that wants the cultural capital of a film. You know, it doesn't mean you have to make a film for the foundation, but 
uh, all the savvy producers I've ever known have always cultivated, um, you know, foundations, family foundations, and presented the film to them. And, you know, you can't do anything without some seed money. Uh, you don't want to burn through your, you know, your children's um, <laughs> university <laughs> funds, <fees. yeah. laughs> um, You know, so, uh, and then the last thing I'll say is, if you're making a film which has a lot of archival licensing, yeah. you know, that has been a really sad thing to witness where filmmakers have not costed out, you know, what their archival stuff is going to add up. So be realistic about rights right. and permissions and have all of that squared. And if you have an enormous budget for rights and licensing, you know, it's, ITVS is going to be very, very afraid of your film, mm. you know, um, so just be really, really, you have to be so um, DIY and so, it's such a challenging field. Um, so I would say, you know, never give up, but be very realistic and um, personable <laughs> and circulate. Joanna, you have been such an inspiring and insightful conversationalist. I cannot thank you enough. In, in fact, I will make sure and tell your father that how insightful and, and, and inspiring you have been <laughs> if we get to talk to him. <laughs> that will reassure him greatly. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> wow. Uh, and, and the website is joannaraybiger.com, and I will be sure to put, um, put uh, all of Joanna's information up on um, – um, I will be sure and put uh, put her information and her website up in our show notes. Joanna, thank you so much. This has been a long time coming, and uh, this is going to truly be one of the more impact episodes we've ever had here on the program. I cannot thank you oh, enough. Oh, that's very sweet of you to say so. You can also look at my LinkedIn, which I tend to update more uh, more so than my uh, webpage. I will try and Great. update my webpage, but um, uh, the LinkedIn is really where you can see just the the number of projects that I work on. Yes. Um, you know, and so just I hope that one of your uh, listeners' projects will become uh, one of those projects listed and that I can help. Absolutely. I envision <laughs> that at some point in the future for sure, if, if, if not my own. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad we finally got down to it. And it was really, really fun. What a pleasure. Thank you so much, Joanna. Don't forget, we'd love to have you join us in the Documentary Academy. Come and take a look at how we can help you make your best documentary film at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. That's thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.